Hello everyone, I am Joan Turner, founder of the Intuitive Body and Soul. This is my co-host, uh, Deb Carpenter, and our special guest today is Mike Stevens. You are watching the Intuitive Body and Soul. And we are so excited today. I have been waiting and waiting and waiting for this. And everyone, you know, on Facebook, this, this, and that, I keep posting all this stuff because I'm so excited. And people are like, yeah, we know, we know, we know. You know, but I have been excited for today. So we want everyone to meet Mike Stevens. Mike Stevens is the founder of Granite Sky, okay? And he's been uh, interviewed a number of times on TV, on radio. And I think one of the things that uh, drew me to your site is that you put people first. I think one of the taglines was people not proof, okay? So I really liked that. And you said you were on the website and were quite impressed as well. I was well. very impressed, yes. Yeah. You provide a lot of services. A lot of information on there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, services, mm -hmm. um, events. It was great. It was the, really nice. And I think the fact, like I said, that you put the people first is really uh, what makes a difference. Because I remember reading people before proof, and I've not ever seen that anywhere else. Okay, so Mike is a ufologist. Is that, is that what you call yourself? Um, yeah, to a degree. To a um, degree. Less about standard ufology as it has been, where that's been more nuts and bolts, scientific. Can we mm. prove it? Can we not? Um, to me, if we really want to understand this, uh, we need to go to the people first. Nice, nice. So you founded Granite Sky. So what is that all about? Is that a platform so people can kind of come together? Um, yeah, it was kind of a, a, a landing spot to launch a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely People Not Proof is my newest, uh, you know, outreach and kind of my baby at this point. It's really what I'm about because, um, you know, whether we can prove UFOs are real, extraterrestrial or not, doesn't really matter at the end of the day for a lot of people who've had these experiences. Those experiences are real to them no matter what we prove or don't prove and that's really where my heart is with helping those people. That's what I think was so impressive to me. It's like you're not so much about proving like, yeah, this person really had this experience, but they experienced something because it has made such a big difference in their life and people are afraid to come forward with this. Let me back up for a second. How long, how long have you been doing this? Uh, Granite Sky is just over a year old. I was with another organization I founded before that, Seco Saucers, for about oh, okay. three years. Okay, yeah. um, but that was, Seco Saucers was more handling the social aspects of the stigma around the topic, but it wasn't really pushing the help towards the experiencers like it should have been. So that's why I decided to leave and restart and reboot and come out with Granite Sky. So it's been, a, it's been a growing or evolving experience. Um, people, are, aren't they afraid to come forward? There's a lot of stigma attached. You think we live in a time where you know, people are enlightened. You know, everyone knows, all right, it's naive to think we're the only planet that has life on it, so on and so forth. But when it does come to the abductions and the sightings, people are still kind of, you know, uh, it has kind of almost a giggle factor. If you say UFOs or this, that, people go, oh yeah, psh, you know, this type of thing. So people who have these experiences are afraid to come forward. Is that Yeah, that's true. It's happens? amazing how long and how, you know, deep the stigma with it runs. The but trauma, the trauma of it. Not being believed. Yeah. yeah that's it, the hardest thing. And the really funny thing is when, you know, you put yourself out there and say, look, I'm, o I'm here, I'm open to talk about this. How many people have an experience or a sighting, or if they don't themselves know somebody one off, oh, my mother did, my brother did. There's so many, it's such a big topic, it's happening to so many people more so than people understand. And sure. it's amazing that the stigma's still there, because if everybody came forward right. and said something, we could overturn it in a heartbeat. Right, right, right. See, that's my thought, too. I think there's more out there than we know about, and the reason is that people are afraid to come forward. Now, one of the things that I've heard you say before is that uh, people are afraid of losing their jobs, uh, their credibility becomes in question, right? So how do, you, how do you help someone? How do you help someone? Say I have an experience, and now I'm like, 
you know, I'm really troubled by it, and I see your site, and I say, all right, this guy is more concerned with me than the experience I come to you. How do you help me? Um, it really depends on your situation, what your experience was, and where you're at with it. Um, there is no, like, start at point A and end up at point B, because how this affects everybody and where they're at with it and the depth and how long they've been hiding their own traumas mm -hmm. really affects all that. Um, so it is very individualized. You can't just make a one plan and make everybody no fill cutter. out the same form. No cookie cutter. To really that's question nice. your own sanity is really something. Yeah, and well to and live with that, it's hard. So a place to really talk about it to other people that are also questioning the same thing and can understand what you're going through is important. Yeah, and, and that's where a lot of it starts, getting them to be comfortable within their own experience, coming sure. to terms with it and understanding it. And it's not, you know, like you might think, you come in, I don't have you lay on a couch like I'm a, a hypnotist or a doctor and above you. <laughs> that's what you were saying. You know, I, they, they kind of start to yeah. talk, and then I usually throw out some of my own experiences just to level the plate and ground. You know, like, I'm no better than you, you you're no better than, we're all in this together. We're all equal. And I, th and I agree, I think it helps to know that other people have had these experiences, we're not the only one. So, so it's uh, not a cookie cutter, you're kind of customizing according to each person, but you have a group, is it like a support group? I can come in and listen to your story, Debbie's story. Debbie has some really interesting stories, but not about UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe. So, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, um, uh, so we all come together, we can talk about all this cool stuff and... Yeah, I mean it's a safe sp spot and you meet other people who've had it. So one that it's automatically helps, mm -hmm. you know, not feeling alone, crazy, like... Y no judgment. No judgment. No judgment. <laughs> but how do you, how do you help um, when they say, I, I can't tell my family about it, they're going to think I'm crazy, or you know, um, I lost my job because someone heard me say, how do you help them with the everyday ramifications of this? Well, you have to really get them to understand that you can't control anything outside of you. If this is true to you and this is your real life, own it. Stand up for yourself. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, and I'll be right here behind you. And that's, you know, there's other support groups that offer services. I think we're one of the only ones, at least in the area. I was going to say in this area, yeah. That um, yeah. offers what we call breakthrough support, which goes a step further. And if you feel the need to tell your family, your friends, and don't know how to start that conversation, where we will work with you through that process oh, to, okay. and it helps, because then you have somebody with you, or you know, they may want a group of people who have been through this and go, look, I'm not crazy. This happened to them, them, mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Right, they can back you up. Mm -hmm. That's nice. And it's at least moral support to get right. through it. Right. I mean, the outcome, you can never make your friend's family believe you or not believe you, but you can at least get it out there and say, no, this is who I am. And you can feel better about yourself. And that's always going to be a place to start. Right, because once you get through that first hard step, you can then live your life and start to heal your own trauma. You don't have to hide behind this curtain. You can talk about it now. Whether they believe you or not, it's not. It's up to them. Right. Well, we're seeing so much of that in the news lately, yeah. where women are coming forward with the different things that are happening to them over the years. And it's so important to, to voice it and to get it just out there because you keep it inside and it festers and it's, it's hard. So that's really yeah. important. Your, your group is great. So how do, um, how do people know, like, if they have their, first of all, there are different kinds of abductions. The abduction is one kind of encounter, right? There yes. are four different kinds? Um, yeah. What, explain what they are. So um, Hynek, who was a researcher for years, okay. um, he came up with this scale of the four uh, close encounters. Close um, encounters of the four. First the first kind is um, sighting an object craft um, in the sky, sky. Uh, closer than 500 feet. Oh. The second close encounter um, is leaving trace evidence, whether it be a marks from a landing, burn marks, broken branches that support you know what people saw. Mm -hmm. um, the third kind, which I think most people are familiar with because of the Spielberg film, is um, 
some type of interaction back and forth with them, um, but it's usually more friendly. Whereas as we get into the fourth kind, which was not originally part of Heineck scale, which includes the abduction. Now, I, uh, thank you for saying that because I get them confused, you know, encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind. So you're right, from that movie, Spielberg's movie, we kind of uh, get a little bit of an introduction and they were communicating with lights and then the beings supposedly came off the ship and they were able to communicate again. So is the third kind just any kind of communication? Or like if the aliens didn't come out of the ship and it was just lights back and forth, would that be an encounter of the third kind? Yeah, if it seems intelligent, okay. not just random as All in right. response to that's something. And with the third kind, I should mention um, that's extraterrestrial um, initiated. Now they've added oh, to the scales, not okay. part of the original scale is the fifth kind, which oh. is human-initiated contact. You see a lot of this big movement now for uh, CE5s, which that's what it stands for, Close C. Encounters of the Close Fifth encounter. okay. Kind, where it's humans actually going out and trying to make contact. And they can actually do that? How, um, do, how do you go about, if I wanted to contact an ET, how would I go about doing that? There's. Some people just gather together and it's very intent based. They sit in an area, open okay. area, where oh, they yeah. think there may be I've and shine that. lights out and try to get responses back. Uh, my group hosts a meditation based. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that stars themselves make sounds. We have a recording of different star sounds that we play as a meditation oh, cool. and try to reach out through meditation to um, make contact, which this, the physical aspect of this is very real, but when we start, start to get away from the nuts and bolts part of this and start talking to the people about what their encounters actually entailed, we start to realize there's a really big spiritual or non-physical component to this as so well. So they overlap, like they paranormal and... Uh, so by spiritual, you think you're saying meditation, um, uh, intention... Yeah, dream. uh, dreams. Dreams. So... I would consider that stuff kind of paranormal, yes? Yes. So do you find that they overlap? Um, I do. I okay, mean, a lot do. of situations where if you didn't believe in UFOs or mm -hmm. ghosts, the, the situation could start out very much the same, seeing shadowy figures in your bedroom, finding stuff in the house moved, waking up with strange mm -hmm. marks on you. Mm -hmm. That could very much be a haunting situation or it could be very much um, an abduction or experiencing experiencing so people who have those experiences are called experiencers experiencers yeah Do I have the terminology right and I everything that I'm reading uh, tells me that they do indeed overlap so if in fact you think that you're a seeing spirit that could be an entity right that it, could be an alien entity it could and okay. there's been um, abduction cases where People have been let out to a field because they see a recently deceased uh, family member, like a grandmother, right. at the edge of the woods. And, you know, it's usually close to the time of passing. So they're distraught and they, you know, they want to go out and see, have sure. that one last time. And they yeah. follow it out to a field or a clearing and a scenario unplays that is not, you know, mm -hmm. their grandmother or loved one. Okay, so now I, I, I was at the Cry Center and we, me and another woman right yep. we're there so what were we doing there what you were playing music that was the um was star, that the music. star yep. music okay so i have to tell everyone we're in this room and we had turned the lights down and we were sitting on bean bags and i mean you know i sit on a bean bag it's going to take a while to get up so so i'm there in this bean bag i closed my eyes and we're just listening to this music which was star seed music Star seed music? Or star music. Star yeah. music. So I'm there. I have my eyes closed. But you know if you put your hand in front of your face, you can still kind of see a shadow, even with your eyes closed. So I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, you know, I see this shadow kind of goes by. And I'm thinking, all right, it's Mike. Mike just walked by. You know, so uh, my first thought, actually, is that you were very light on your feet. <laughs> because I didn't hear, I didn't feel anything. But I saw this shadow kind of go by. And that lasted for, what, about 45 minutes? That, yeah. that So at the end, the shadow actually went the other way. It was like he walked from one end of the room to the other, stayed there for like 40, 45 minutes, and then walked back. 
And so uh, after we turned the lights on and we were kind of chit-chatting about it, I wasn't going to say anything because I just figured, it's Mike, he's walking back and forth. And then uh, for some reason I said, you know, did you get up and walk across the room because you know, I saw this shadow. And at that point, another woman said, oh my God, I saw it too. And I thought I just made it up. And, and Mike was like, no, I never moved. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, something that I saw with my eyes closed and she did as well. And Mike says he did not move, which I totally believe. Cause like I said, you know, I didn't feel any vibration on the floor. You know, I didn't hear anything. It was actually just the seeing of a shadow. So, so what was, what was that? What did I experience? I know no one has all the answers because right, yeah. <laughs> um, he's like, oh yeah, great. Ask me that. Yeah. Um, no. So I couldn't say with any certainty what it was or wasn't, but uh, we found that thinking? with that group in particular is people, um, have the same experience within the meditation, much yeah. like you experience that night. It was night. awesome. Um, a lot of the same symbology there'll almost be a theme for the night like everybody you know interprets things their own way mm -hmm. but everybody will go around the room and say what they saw and it's all so uh, individual sure, sure. filtered version of the same thing so it leads us to think that they are receiving some the group as a whole is receiving some type of message from what well we can't really well, your consciousness is all connected, and your intention right, was to bring them in. Right. So I would say and that then, it's but probably... But intention was not. It was not to bring anyone in, was it? Well, it's to make contact with make them. Oh, it they, was? It, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. You saw one. <laughs> I know, but oh I my didn't goodness. know. I did not know that that was our intention. You know, we're yes. listening to this. I'm thinking, you know, we're meditating or we're doing this and that. I did not realize that. Oh, God, am I good. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. So oh, well, then that makes it really cool. <laughs> All right, so. I'm surprised you didn't see the helicopters flying above you. Because usually when there's a sighting, you see the black, um, which ones? The, the helicopters. Yeah, some type of some military, of not. Kind of military, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I just, I didn't hear, it. I mean, I was listening to the music, obviously. But I did not hear anyone walk by or anything like that. As a matter of fact, just a shadow. And that woman saw exactly the same thing at the same time, which was cool. Although she, I don't think she saw a shadow go back, just forward. I can't remember mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So what? So we were trying to make contact, and we did. What did we make contact with? That's you know the open-ended <laughs> oh, question. Yeah, you I go, mean, John, an alien being. Based on our. Our spirit. Based yes. on our intent. Yeah. We connected with some type of energy that was there, you know, because we weren't looking for anything negative. Right. Something right, right. that was there to help or even just curious as what we so, were doing. So, spirit or ET? Do we know? Are we just not going to know? Or I don't think we're going to know. We could label okay. it, but that's not going to make us... Not going to help at all. Right. Yeah, and I'm a Virgo. I can't help <laughs> it. It's one of those But yeah, there is so much... In, I think that what we consider a ghost of paranormal... Yeah, yeah. However it operates, I think these extraterrestrials have the same capabilities and can operate along the same lines, if not the same way. So if there's actual overlap, I can't say, but it's very similar, it if feel, not. It feels like it. It feels like it. That's I think they don't want to scare you. If they just appear so in the too. middle of the room, yeah. everybody would be so frightened. So <laughs> that they're, they're loving beings. That I really, truly believe that. I mean, there might be some that are not, but... Mainly, I think that they're, they're trying to help us. I really feel yeah, that in my heart. That's a good point. And so just that little, that little breeze yeah. was just enough for you to believe. I almost didn't say anything at all. Because, well, yeah, like I that's said. That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see his face? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so what is it you're trying to say, Deborah? I actually was not going to say anything at all. You had I, contact. I thought it was him. So that was kind of exciting. And now, like I said, because I realized that's what we were there for, that's even more exciting. Um, so it raises a very good question about ETs. Now, there are good people. There are some people that are negative. I have to assume that the same thing is true of ETs. So when people have especially abduction kind of experiences, some, the most that we hear are frightening frightening things. But are there also people who have good encounters? Because I've read that too. Yeah, so yeah. to double back on 
kind of the word experience there. A lot of people have had abduction type scenarios mm -hmm. don't like the word abductee anymore because uh. it's very scary and frightening, traumatizing at the time, but as they kind of grow with it and begin to understand and incorporate it into their life, they kind of think there was a purpose. They feel a calling to do better, to help the planet, to that they, they're on some type of mission. So they don't like the word abductee because it has such a negative condensation. So if experiencer abducted, can yeah. cover a wide variety of so experiences. So the experiences they're having uh, now or lately, are they any sort of harmful or are they just connecting with the um, alien, alien that's... Um, that's a good question. Meet their meeting. Yeah. Um, do you think maybe they had a plan, probably when they came down to this earth, that they were going to help the ETs to help us? Um, that oh, could be who's too. Who's coming to help the ETs? We. Oh, we. We. Oh, there are people that like will help workers. them light help workers. us. Yes, okay. light workers, okay. um, to try to incorporate their their um, knowledge their technology to help us. Help us be more loving, um, kind to each other. But I think if they just landed in the middle of a parking lot, we would all freak out. <laughs> I, mean, I would know. I would like to see that, I think. But they say be careful what oh. you ask for. Right? <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of the whole um, star seed thing for oh, people who okay. aren't familiar with the term. Um, like you said, that's a great analogy. It's very similar to light workers. They believe yeah. they made some type of soul contract before they were Correct, here. Yeah you know, in a human body yeah. to come down and help. They signed up for all these experiences. And when you have that mindset, you can kind of get over the trauma and say, all right, it was scary, but it's no more scary than taking a three-year-old to the doctors. It's, I, it's yeah, just a checkup, make, you know. So that's why a lot of them like the term experiencer. Right. Because they didn't suffer any sort of medical procedures or anything? Yeah, well, well even if they the had, past. they oh. think of it as more of, it had to be done. It's more, you know, if you break your arm and the doctor has to reset it, well, it's scary, it hurts, it's, you know, causes a trauma, but it had to be done. So once we, that's the other part of the question you originally asked before I went off on a rant. Um, that's all right, we like when you <laughs> rant. I could listen all day. No, I lost it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Well, it'll, it'll come back to you. Um, so most, at my, my question is, is years ago you would read of uh, abductees and they were always kind of horrific. You know, these medical tests were done, people were uncomfortable mm -hmm. and actually in pain. Um, but I've also since then read about abductions that were pleasant, okay, where people were not forced to do things that they didn't want to do. So now, recently, the people that you have coming to you, are they more pleasant now than they used to be? Experiences. Experiencers. Yeah. Are they more pleasant uh, than they used to be? Are we advancing at all? Do you see any difference? Um, we actually have a really good mix. Um, a lot of the people who are having more current experiences that I'm dealing with, this might not be across the board, are definitely having more of the better. They feel like they're being taught stuff or enlightened. Um, Good. And that's kind of why we don't call our group a support group, because yeah. um, we like the mix. It's, we want the full yeah. picture. And yep. when people have only had good experiences, it helps them to see the other side of it. And when people have only had negative experiences, it helps them to see the other side of it yeah, too. That's good. So mm -hmm. it's come around a lot more lately and. They, everybody thinks it's because the spiritual stuff is it's taken coming, more of a yeah. foothold, yeah. Um, you know, socially. But even in a lot of the earlier nuts and bolts research, they were using terms like meta-terrestrial because they were, um, you know, things were happening that they couldn't fit into a category. Um, they tried to put in all the dreamlike stuff in part of the Close Encounters. Um, Ballet was another researcher who wanted all that added into the categories mm -hmm. and it just didn't make the cut because it was so nuts and bolts. And that's kind of, it set the standard for what an abduction or experience was, yeah. which was a double-edged sword. If your experience matched that, they'd say, all right, we believe you. But if your experience were outside of that, they then said, they well, yeah. So they kind of had a criteria. If you met this 
uh, condition, that mm. condition, so on and so forth, down the line, then you're legit. Right. And if, if you didn't, then you but were it, not. But the other side of that problem was, too, they could say, well, of course, that's what you think your experience was. You're just copying what. <laughs> right. So right. you couldn't win for trying. Right. You're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place at that point. So again, that's why I think putting the person first it makes a big difference. Um, I like to think as a race, we're kind of advancing in general. So I like to think that that's true. Let me ask you a kind of controversial thing. Um, do you think that there's a secret space program? Do you think that the government is involved? I read something that most of the UFOs that you see are made by us, the man-made UFOs, and that um, reverse you know, engineered. This whole reverse engineered. Reverse engineered, but and this kind of shocked me, and I hope that this is not true, that the government actually okayed a certain amount of abductions in exchange for uh, engine, uh, technology. technology. Technology, because really, when you think about it, why does an alien want money? They have no use for money. They have no use for credit cards. So what do they have a use for? Power, knowledge, technology. So do you think any of that is true or is that just all conspiracy theory type stuff? Um, I think some of it's true. Um, you know, really there are no UFOs. They're either ours or theirs. And I think it's been that way for a long time. I think us as general citizens don't have that information, but I right. definitely think there's people in the know um, I believe the government, or you know, we'll kind of put that in quotes, because it's not our normal operating lawmaking. Right. There's okay. higher, higher hidden levels. Yeah, yeah higher. Um, and that's kind of another reason I think the stigma stuck around some t so long is a lot of people, if they start really making progress to figuring this out, seem to disappear, get a lot of military right. pressure, helicopters right. around, and. You know, it's gone as far as a lot of people have had experiences that uh, simulate a abduction, abduction, but it's not oh, fear to put the fear. Into but it's us, yeah, so it's we it's human made. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I was like shocked when I read or heard that, and it was like the most amazing thing to me that our own government would be involved in something like that. But like I say, you know, but ETs it's not only government; not, uh, it's um, these corporations, corporations right, that right, have right. mega millions yeah, money. and yeah, that the um, heck technology. Part of it makes sense if we follow the timeline here in America. You know, supposedly, when this treaty or deal went down, mm. would be in the mid '50s, and then we start to see the After rise. Roswell. In, yes, After Roswell. and then we start to see the major rise in abduction okay. cases. After that, into the '60s. Mm. Um, so it makes sense on that timeline, but what doesn't make sense is um, this is a worldwide problem. This isn't just an right. issue right, right. here it's global. in the United States. So th this is part of the other problem. I think we, as humans, we, they, you know, we loop everything into one group. It's they up there where many. there might be, <laughs> yeah, many, many sections and mm -hmm. one might have, you know, made a contract or said, you guys look the other way, we're going to do this, and we'll give you a little something on the side. Mm -hmm. That's that, uh, you know, I read that, and there's something inside me just clicked. It really resonated that that could have some truth to it. Also, I remember Reagan saying in public, you know, um, I'm not going to get the wording exact, so I'm going to kind of summarize. But what he said is imagine if there were um, a threat from outer space, then all of our little differences would not matter. We would have to come together as a race and we would have to forget about all these little trivial differences, race, religion, all this good stuff, if there was a threat from outer space. And then he was shot at. And he okay. also made a statement, some along those lines about the Star Wars program where he yes. said, no, no, those don't just point down. Right, <laughs> right. So I think uh, in most cases, the president probably is on a need-to-know basis. Most of them don't know. But I think Reagan did, or at least he had some knowledge, and he was shot at. And then, of course, JFK 
he, um, you know, more I read about him, he did have some knowledge as well, and he was also taken out. I think, you know, our own government is responsible for that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know what the end plan is, but right. there's a major theme between just government, corporations, greed money. to control the masses. <laughs> yeah, money for us. Money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think it started way back with um, your formalized religions. I think that's where your cover up a UFO started, to tell sure, you the truth, sure. not, you know, with government. Yeah. But because it started with power and controlling the masses. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Because, I mean, even the corporations have enough money. They probably don't need more money. They're looking for is power, control. technology, control. Okay. So I think that, and anyone who has tried to uh, disclose information, right? Because I think we get a lot of disinformation, all right? We get a lot of information that's fed to us wrong on purpose, okay? And I think that's why we have the giggle factor. You know, Roswell, uh, I think, kind of started everything off. First, first they told the truth about it. Yep, okay, we had a UFO that crashed here. And then on top of that, oh no, it's just a weather balloon. Okay, so then we have all this cover-up. And then people who talk about abductions, sightings, this and that, they're not seen as credible. And I think it's done to them on purpose. Yeah, I mean, with the Roswell, a lot of people were told it's a big desert, they'll never find your body. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. That's what I mean, those threats, and some of them not so veiled. Right. <laughs> so I have to ask you, how did you get started in this? Did you have an experience? I did. Um, Will, you my share? Will you tell us? Yeah. I love it. Okay, I <laughs> so, can do this way now. Yeah, uh, you don't get into the, this. Is kind of one of the big misnomers with this thing. Like people are afraid to come out and tell their stories. Nobody wants to be in this, you know, group. Right. And so they've also thrown out the little bit of misinformation. Oh, people want their five minutes of fame on the news or this or that. And it's so not the case. Right. You, you have people shaking it's and want everything. Yeah, for sure. So for me, it started. Uh, the first time I remember, I was about three years old, I was at my grandmother's house, um, and she had a little sun porch behind the dining room, mm -hmm. and the sun porch I overlooked the backyard and the woods out there. Um, we had some type of family function, like my aunts, uncles, and everybody was all there. And I walked by the dining room, and there was an immediate call to get outside. I had to get outside. Um, I don't remember. Immediate call, like you heard it, or someone physically, I mean, your relatives say, hey, come on out. No, like Is just a, an, a, a pull. A pull, yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, I don't remember how I got outside. When I got outside, my cousin was outside in the driveway as well. She's six months older than me. Um, we were watched like hawks. There's no way one of us would have, you know, made it out the door in the middle of the night, never mind both of us, but there we were. Um, then the woods behind my grandmother's house, they started glowing red like there was a fire or something. Oh, wow. And then from above the tree line, this large craft arose to the top of the tree line and floated like across the lawn towards, towards us in the driveway and stopped by um, a big tree at the end of the driveway. It's amazing. And that was it? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Keep going. She's like, what? <laughs> Come on, we want to hear this good story. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, well, the amazing thing, it's probably like 40 feet and wow, with, okay. you know, It must have been guess. so huge, you were three. Yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. just. Could you see anything inside? Some people say they see Did beams. you go inside? Oh, okay, all right, wait, finish telling the story. Right. Okay, so, sorry. And that's, you know, kind of <laughs> one of the parts of this that's always yeah. stuck in my mind is just watching this big thing, like, you say, it floated, but I don't know if people understand that. Like, it didn't fly, it didn't, it like floated, like something this big, this, we assume metallic and heavy without engines, just okay. so gracefully just. Now your cousin was with you? Yes. Okay, keep going. <laughs> um, so it sat there next to this tree for a while, and you just had this, in, you know when somebody's looking at you, how you can feel it? Yeah. It was like that, but like down to the, it was like a primal fear. Like you knew you, something was looking Inside. at you. Yeah. Ah. Um, and then there was a row of lights around the thing and it kind of rolled almost like liquid, not like light bulbs. And all of a sudden the, um, 
pattern on it changed. It became like more aggressive, the pat of the brighter, faster, flashing lights. And when that happened, like an interior light came on in this thing, and you could make out a row of windows. They were like square windows just above the middle uh, on the top of it. And you couldn't see any features or anything, but you could see shadows of something Neat. that looked hu humanoid. Oh. Oh, um, I say, oh cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then for a long time, that was my standing memory. There was a big blank, and the next thing I remember was this craft being at the other end of the driveway above a telephone pole. It kind of sat there for a second and then shot out in the space like from uh, this 40 foot <laughs> object to a dot in the blink of an that eye. So did you experience lost time? Not that I know of, because at that age, I don't think I was watching oh, the clock. And well, what about your cousin? Does she remember all this? She's only six months old, um, so she's was Well, so we young. grew up, and we didn't really discuss it, but it was nonchalant. Yeah. Do you remember the UFO we saw growing up? <coughs> and it was always, yeah, and it didn't really get into a conversation. It was about... My mid-twenties, I said, all right, I was starting to get more involved with this, coming to terms with, you know, my own experiences and stuff. And I said, all right, I need to talk to her. And, you know. Did you have more experiences after that? Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Plus, your fam now, you, had, you were at a family outing. Did anyone else, the adults, see it? And did they come forth? Did they tell you? Not on that occasion. Um, uh, eventually, it would come out uh, as I got more pronounced and outstanding and saying, no, I was going to do this type of stuff. I don't care who knows. Um, some news of something I did was, did was making its rounds through the family. Um, and that's when it all started coming out like, oh, did you know this, this, we saw a UFO here, this one saw a UFO oh. here. Oh. My great uncle was uh, kicked out of a private school in the 60s for claiming he was abducted oh, by aliens. See? Mm, stigma. Stigma yeah, and it was funny because we were one of those families. You could talk about ghost goblins all day. That was fine, but nobody talked nobody about UFOs. About the elephant yeah. in the room. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, were you ever taken aboard a ship? Do you remember? Um, yeah, it's, I've had a good question. <laughs> so, I ended up having regression about that incident mm -hmm. um, much later in life. Um, a regression about which incident? The, the, the one at my one. grandmother's, because okay. I'd always felt like there was a middle there somewhere, somewhere. that I couldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was still very fearful, so I, my mind was still blocking a lot of it. Sure. But it did appear um, that I did go on to the craft. Um, I, I had one little memory of a as I was getting onto the craft of a creature, but I didn't see his face or his like feet really, only kind of from his knees to mid torso. And it, it was funny because as I was going through the regression, he kind of looked hunched over and almost like a chicken wing type arm, like oh. it had an extra section okay. of forearm than we would. Um, but I remember feeling bad for it, like he felt hunched, which was he always was weird to me yeah, yeah. Uh, that that wouldn't have been his normal position and then as the regression kind of went through um, it kind of revealed that it was more of a not a celebration of me but more almost like a birthday party they were there to check up and so it kind of like even Maybe though it's the fir back. first Maybe time I remembered you. but it <laughs> led hey. it felt familiar you know in the regression once you could remember it all that there was probably previous times sure and Sounds we find like that it. we find that with a lot of people, they have they might oh, start yeah. as an adult having one experience, and that's what they're coming in for. And the more they backtrack it and start opening their mind up, they're like, "Well, there was this one time that this was weird when I was a kid, and doesn't make any sense." I mean, some of the excuses we can come up with to rationalize this stuff sure. are mm -hmm. crazier than <laughs> believing the experience in itself. <laughs> So your family did not come forth until you actually had enough confidence to come forth. And then you heard all these stories. So you did have hypnosis regression yeah. type things. And did that help you remember more and more? Like, do you remember what happened when you were on the ship? Just a little bit. Um, I ended up snapping myself out of the regression um, okay. because it seemed my cousin was on the and that's kind of was the emotional breaking point for oh, me in the okay. regression but All right. um, okay yeah. so she was on the ship at the same time yes 
Oh, all right. So maybe whatever was going on there snapped yeah. you out of it. So, um, so some of the experiencers, some of them have lost time, correct? Correct. So does hypnosis or regression usually help in cases like that? Yes, it can. Okay. It, I mean, your mind blocks things out yeah. naturally. And with this... Um, to protect yourself. Right. And with this, there seems to be a a double dose with a forced amnesia sure. on top of that from... And you think aliens can blank slate you? I think they try, but it, it leads back to are they bad, are they good? Well, if right, they were right. here to hurt us, or didn't, why would they want us to forget? They, True. they try to block the trauma for you, too. Mm -hmm. right. So, I mean, you're, right, right. it's really been one of the interesting things when you get away from standard ufology and look at mm -hmm. the broad picture of what's really going on, like how expansive and how even within a field of believing in something that a lot of people don't believe, we've cordoned off so many yeah. roads ourselves by... Yeah. So I, I think that it helps and normalizes it by people talking about it in a sane and open way. Because a lot of times there's a lot of sensationalism. There is. You know, UFO like, yeah, you know, and people do all this funny stuff and party. And so you work in this area, southern New Hampshire and even Maine. Yeah. And I know that you are responsible, or partially responsible, for getting the plaque for Betty and Bonnie Hill. Oh, yeah. Now, for those of, uh, for anyone listening who doesn't know about that, can you give us a little synopsis there? And Yeah, so Betty and Barney Hill were an interracial couple in the 60s, so. In this, in Maine, New Hampshire? Uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire Portsmouth. is where they lived. Okay. Um, so, you know, not that that matters so much to me or even modern day, but in the 60s, that was... It was a big deal. That, that was a big deal, and you were not going to draw any more attention to yourself than you needed, especially over this stuff. So mm -hmm. I like to keep that fresh in people's mind. But they were both well-respected members of the community, serving on boards. Betty was a social worker. Mm -hmm. Barney was a, a worked for the post office. I mean, they were well-respected, regular, you know... Regular, everyday people. So they went on a little mini vacation up to Niagara Falls in Canada. Um, and they were coming back, as they were coming back home, they heard a tropical storm was coming in. So they kind of forewent getting a hotel for the night. Barney's like, no, I'm not that tired. I can drive. They were having problems finding a hotel because they had their dog with them. And so they decided, all right, we're going to drive home. Um, as they were driving, Betty saw what she thought was a shooting star out the passenger window until it moved upward. Um, Barney was a no-nonsense guy. Like, he was a good guy, but he, he didn't UFO believe. stuff, yeah. he had no room for to, um, and Betty was fairly <laughs> open to it and intrigued by what was going on. So as they, you know, progressed, they started getting closer and closer, um, you know, sightings of this object. At one point where the old man in the mountain was, the profile's 48 feet long. They saw this object next to it, and it was double the size of it. Okay, so um, that gives you an idea of how Yeah, long they, um, the, uh, you know, as they got a little farther down the road, the thing kind of went right above their car. Well, first it was almost directly in front of them at tree level on the road. He had to slam on the brakes. He got out to look at it. The object moved over to a field um, adjacent to the road, and that's when Barney with the binoculars saw um, figures in it, which he thought reminded him of, um, he could somehow tell they weren't human, but reminded him of German officers. Um, Barney also served in World War II, so again, this is his mind trying to protect yeah, him. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and then, so he got scared, obviously, um, you know, started speeding down the road. Um, the next thing they heard was a series of toad uh, tone or code like beeps that kind of not only audibly like vibrated but it rattled the car through their bodies. Uh, they drove another 31 miles um, before they talked to each other when the second set of beeps happened. Um, at this point they only kind of remembered like a orangey fiery orb in the road, some type of roadblock um, and they were just desperate for human contact at this point sure. so they we're trying to find an open restaurant in Concord, New Hampshire. They didn't find one. So they headed just straight back for Portsmouth. And they noted as they got there that they could see the sun starting to come out. 
Um, so they knew it was later than they thought, but it wasn't until much after they figured out they're about two to three hours later than they yeah. should have been. Uh -huh. um, and the hypnosis that kind of pulled the whole story out didn't come out, until, this happened in 1961, didn't come out until 1963, mm -hmm. 64. The hypnosis wasn't to go in and regress this missing time per se. It was because Barney was um, falling apart. The incident had, you know, left him with some trauma, trauma and yeah. Yeah. he was having ulcers and this and that and treatments weren't working because he couldn't forget about, he couldn't wrap his mind around why they were so late. So they decided to do the regression to kind of ease that for medical reasons and when, once they got into it, um, but that's a quick version. There's a lot more. But There's a lot more to <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. But, that's but they had a lot of, um, a lot of medical things that the aliens did to them. Yes. Um, um, too. And didn't he feel really bad that his wife was put through that? Yeah, the, and because he definitely felt like couldn't as protect her. The man he should have protected her yeah, and kept yeah, her right, from that. Right. And Plus, I, if I remember everything I read, she said when they were doing medical. Um, um, not experiments, but they were checking her out medically. It At one point, she was in a lot of pain, and she said that the alien did, like, touched her or whatever, and that it went away, okay? And then under hypnosis, that was not the case. Is that correct? Am I remembering it correctly? Because in, under hypnosis, she said, you know, it was very painful, and she remembers pain. So I'm wondering if they, in fact, you know, are able to manipulate memories like that. Now, Miss Debbie over here has a healthy skepticism, and you know, as I was reading about the hypnosis, what was the doctor's name? Simon. Simon? Benjamin Simon. Benjamin Simon. His his final uh, evaluation was that Bonnie was remembering or working off Betty's dreams. Yeah. So this has come up by skeptics as the answer for this for years, and. Um, Kathleen Marden, who is Betty's niece, uh, went back and really worked hard to debunk that. Um, and good, good, because they were quite traumatized by all that. And the you know, sh very short version is Barney's and Betty's regressions, which were recorded separately, match each other 100%. What the regressions don't match is Betty's dreams. Right, that's right. So. Yeah. Whatever they experienced and remembered, they remembered the same. And it was her kept, dreams that were. She kept her dress too, yes, which it, had some um, evidence of something yeah, there not was a, from here. There was quite a bit of physical evidence with the case mm -hmm. um, too. The tops of Barney's shoes were scraped up, his best dress shoes, um, the dress is a big one. Um, and the dress is actually on display at UNH in New Hampshire. You're going to go oh, see it wow. and they have an archive of all their paperwork. and. So that, so I'm wondering about the doctor, the hypnotist. Was it just too much for him to process? Because as I was reading the account, I found it very credible. So I was surprised at his, his final evaluation. So, you know, I mean, like I said, healthy skepticism is okay because it leads us to look for answers. But as you at Greenwich Sky say, the person is what's most important. And they did not originally go looking for popularity no, or, the, you know. We were not supposed to know about this case. All. It got leaked by a newspaper reporter and it ran for five, the story ran for five days in the Boston Traveler. Yeah. And that was a breach of confidentiality. It was never supposed to be out. Wasn't supposed to be there, and I think that fact alone is that they were not looking for fame. They were not looking to get their story out. So why would you make something up and then just keep it to yourself? Well, and now because of the technological age we live in, um, you can go on like YouTube and hear the regressions. Right. Um, if yeah. you listen to Barney's, it's very clear that this is a man who is in agony and mm -hmm. trauma, trying to remember what he just went through. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no way he's making this up. Right. I think that you can tell. I think you can tell. We went to um, uh, Noma, Noma Slavic, Slavic? Slavic, I think. Slavic, yeah. okay. So we went, and uh, Noma is, a, a, is an author, 
and he deals with uh, UFO phenomenon and, and stuff like that. And we had seen some hypnosis on, on his film or in his book. And um, you could tell that those people were not, first of all, they are not professional actors. They were actually sitting in the audience, two of them were. And you could tell by what you were seeing on film. These guys were not making it up. I don't think you can fake emotion like that. No, I don't under hypnotism. Right, they were both under, they were both under hypnotism yeah. and, uh, and you could see the emotion in them. You could see uh, that what they were saying was, real was really to real to them. So, um, so I, I agree, I, you know, I'm surprised. I was surprised at the doctor's final evaluation because like you, I felt that, you know, their feelings were genuine. And again, the fact that they were not looking to uh, get this out to the public, you know, why would you make all that up and then just keep it to yourself? What, well, yeah, the official, yeah. you know, on all this right. stuff in 1965 of December in Kecksburg, um, Pennsylvania, there was a big incident and crash. And the official, uh, um, you know, reasoning for that was it was a meteorite. Um, yeah. The big 1952 flap over the White House, that the official for that is t still temperature inversion. And it, it kind of plays into where we are now with the media control and this and that. We put mm -hmm. out our statements well, what about that and that's it. And what was it, Exeter? And the police that saw um, the, um, the UFO um, ship. Right. Supposedly, policemen, doctors, those are all credible people, supposedly. So, you know, I it's don't think exit, it's... Right? Yes. Yeah, I don't think it makes them more credible than us or anyone else, but people are more likely to believe, believe them. Yeah, especially, yeah. you know, back in the 50s, 60s. Right, right, right. So, what is your goal for Granite Sky? Like, where do you see yourself five years from now? Hopefully retired. Hopefully <laughs> that we all come to this understanding that is real and can just, you know. Work with them. Be yeah, happy they and you won't have to find, you know, not necessarily <laughs> yeah. need that the help will be available anywhere and regularly. Right. I mean, the biggest difference between uh, post traumatic stress disorder and what experiencers go through is that they're not believed and there's no treatment available. Other than that, all the symptoms are really the same. Yeah. I th very interesting. I find the whole thing extremely, extremely interesting. And I think that, uh, I think what you're doing is important and I think it brings it out of la-la land and into something where people can sit and comfortably talk about. Well, it, yeah, it's funny because we still have such a predetermination of what somebody who's into UFOs should be too. I was recently at the Exeter UFO Festival and a guy walked up to me and says, oh, you don't look like you'd be into this. <laughs> you know, well, what should I look like? What should I look like? But yeah, yeah, it happens to doctors, lawyers. Yeah, it yeah, happens yeah. to everybody. It, there's no, like, it only happens to crazy people, in a, you know, right. that they've tried to tell us for years. It's not yes, the case yes. at all. <laughs> so how did you, why did you decide to get the plaque up there, and how did you go about doing that? Um, did that take a long time? It did. Um, I decided that... I found the case to be, you know, substantially true. There was enough to it. Um, and that just because it was weird doesn't mean it shouldn't be part of the history books. So I had no idea how to get a historical marker put up. Um, I wouldn't know either. So it, it starts by a petition. That's the way they all go through. And then um, once it's in that process, they need to verify every word, every statement on that. Mm. Sign. So that's when Kathleen Martin got involved and was really able to help with documents, this, that, and really push it forward. But even then, it took three years. Three years? Yeah. Wow. And it, the state was very clear. They said we were going to put up the marker because of the impact that case had. Um, that's historically significant. We're not backing that there was UFO extraterrestrials or but anything like it that. It happened. It happened. Uh, at least the story happened there. Right. All right. In the interest of time, we want to super, super thank you. And I could talk to you forever and ever. So while we're on the air, will you come back again? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So everyone's yes. listening. Everyone's listening. We have proof. Okay. <laughs> and uh, hang. How did? How can people get a hold of you if they want to know more about you or Granite Sky? 
It has uh, the website, obviously. Yeah, Granite Sky has a website. It's really easy to remember. It's granitesky.org. Um, my email's super easy, too. It's mike at granitesky.org. So, <laughs> but um, Facebook, too. You can find me either through the Granite Sky page or I also okay. co-run um, Spirits and Spaceships, which um, deals with that. this. Yeah. And um, like I said, there's a lot of non-physical stuff with that. So mm -hmm. along with psychic medium Chris, uh, Kristen Capucci, we run that other page to help as many people in a broader spectrum of the whole thing as we can. Nice. So you can find us through nice. either of those. Okay, thank you, thank you. Hang around because uh, Deborah is going to give us an affirmation of the month, okay? And it's something that people can focus on. I think you have all of two and a half minutes, my darling. I will embrace difference with respect. Um, nice. That's really important. Um, there's so many different things that we have to um, experience in our lives. Um, extraterrestrial, but just people say, just down here. For what we're talking about just today. You know, the difference that, um, that people down here have, and for children coming into this world or, or in this world now, um, they need to respect it and accept it. Um, embrace, that's the norm now. The right, that's the norm now. Yeah. I recently went to a gay wedding, and it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. I mean, years ago, I know my family would That's have been a whole nother looked stigma. at it really different, <laughs> yeah. but it, it was so beautiful and mm -hmm. everyone was so accepting and I was really impressed yeah. with the acceptance. Good. A few older people, you know, looked a little funny, but that was all right. 